thoughts. The Holy Spirit, commune with us as we speak with your people. Help us to see what you have us to do. Let us believe we be what you have us to be. Come now, that people place. In Jesus' name. We're going to ask that you return with us to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 26, if you do not mind, and verses 26 through 28. Matthew, chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. When you found it, say, I got it. Um, we shall be reading from a King James Version of the Bible in these are the words that we shall find find printed Matthew chapter And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. He took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Our subject this evening is the meeting of the table. <coughs> we want to, in this course, in this discourse, try to use this as a moment of enlightenment, reminding, reminding us of the importance, significance of the table that is before us. I would admit that there is, or has been, ongoing dialogue with myself and other church leaders as to what is traditional, sacred, what can be done away with, what can be kept. And the church not lose its meaning, <coughs> identity, or its belief. I'm persuaded, at least in my thinking, that in the next 10 years, church as we know it will be no more. I'm not, <clears throat> and I'm going to move quicker with this, I'm not opposed to technology, I'm not opposed to advances that are being made. I am vexed a little bit how we maintain the intimacy of fellowship among believers. Amen. If we move with the paradigm of live stream and with being able to sit at home and watch podcasts, and fail to congregate, do we risk that scripture that says forsake not the assembly 
of your system. Yes, sir. Do we or will we miss the man who was at the gate at the hour of prayer? In Peter fastened his eyes to him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such that I have in the name of Rise up and you, you may be lost a little bit. Let me help you with that. Because in my revelation of that text, what was missing was not people coming to church. But what was missing was the church noticing what was at the gate in making eye contact and physical contact with what was wrong right in front of them. I don't know if you realize it or not, but it's something extremely special when someone touches you Amen. than it is when someone glances at you. She's Peter fastening his eyes on him, engaging with him was able to reach him where he was and assist him where he was and lift him from where he was. There are a lot of things that I and you see in the true in the more modern church that make me ask questions. The absence of the altar rail and the absence of the altar. Can we do without it and still have the message communicated to the people when they come in, and even if there's no preacher there to say a word, that I can look at the table and still get the message of God Amen. that this is his house. His presence abides here. And if there's any need among the congregants, they're in the right. Amen. <clears throat> tell you, you know, I, I got a time to go. The more I visit churches and look, it, it somehow makes me squirm. When I see that there is no place for people to even suggest you can kneel before you. And certainly when there's an absence of the altar, and what do I look to from whatever angle I'm sitting that would bring us all to the same place in a worship experience where God is to be glorified and humanity is to be edified. And that we can somehow be reminded that no matter how treacherous we have been all week long and no matter how many times we have fallen and no matter how messed up that we are, that when we come into his house and we can visualize the table, that we can get the message that for that reason, that I've been struggling all week long, he died. For the reason that I've fallen to a lower place, he died. For no matter how jacked up I am, he died. No matter how dark my life has been, he died. There might be hope for somebody. went into a church recently and I can tell you it's beautiful all over. And I looked 
And I walked in and I noticed the nice carpet and the pews and the comfort. And I saw the baptism. Ooh. I saw no altar rail and I saw no altar rail. Even where there's a divided chancellor, this table would sit all the way against the wall. You would have the lectern or lay and you would have the gospel podium for preaching. But still visible was the altar. We've gotten it mixed up that people say come to the altar. We hasten and come. We stop here. The reality is that we're summoning you to come to the altar rail. That you might present yourself at the altar. Because it, through tradition, this is the thing that is of significance to us. Because yeah. when we were messed up in the Old Testament yeah. and sacrifices were made, they were made on the altar. Yeah. Amen. People may have knelt, but the sacrifice went on the altar. Yeah. And when we come in our prayer petitions to the altar, what we are really communicating to God is that there is something that I need to cast off of me and to be placed on the altar that it might help me be atoned at one with you. Amen. Am I making sense in what I'm saying? There's only two human beings I know that laid on the altar. The first one was bound with ropes and cords and was instructed to lay there. Amen. The second one volunteered Amen. to lay there. Amen. The difference is that when Abram went to sacrifice Isaac, it was a command, an instruction that I want to know, do you love him more than you love me? Yes. And if I ask you to give your son, Isaac, you know there was an Ishmael. Uh, if I ask you to give the promise to me, yeah. would you surrender it? Yeah. And Abram proved that what you promised to me, not even that would I withhold from you. Amen. Thus John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Begotten yes. Son. That he would become the set become. He is the sacrificial lamb for the atonement of sin for a world that had lost its way through Adam. So we have the second Adam who is the mediator for our sin. Who brings us back in fellowship, cornelia, with God. I hope I'm not talking too low beneath you. Hence we are here with a table that is covered in white. Because white symbolizes purity. It symbolizes that there is something Pure. There is something, uh, a cleansing has taken place. The white can get messed up. There's a cleansing process, even for white. What can take away? my sins. What can make me whole again? 
nothing but the blood. The blood of Jesus. I'm kind of trying to take my time because when I see you come back next week, I want you to be able to look at this table and hear the message without me even speaking. Uh, that we're reminded forward this way. No, oh, well, talking to him. Sorry. Him. Oh. <laughs> I got distracted. Here. I'm out of the way. But when we come, we need to know that this is a symbol of, of the white is a symbol of purity. Uh -huh. And that this table stands on L-O-V-E. Uh -huh. uh, love that is pure. Love that has not been taught to love that, that cannot be switched off or, uh, because God cannot turn himself off. He is love. And if he does anything else than love, he is no longer God. If God does anything out of malice, out of anything, out of anger, flat on the plane, he's no longer God. If God does anything because he becomes jealous or envy or God gets so bitter, he is flat on the plane, no longer God. Amen. There's nothing you can do or I can do that can cut him off. You can't stop him from loving us. In everything that God does, he does it out of a pure heart of love. When we look at this table, we should be able to see the symbol of what symbolizes a body, a corpse, a human being lying. If you're familiar with funerals, I don't know how many of y'all attend, but there are some people back home that everybody that died, they go, whether they know them or not. But the undertaker have a tendency that when we are viewing, to raise the head. And the imagery here is that someone has died. I'll come back to that. While the candles, two candles that we have, we have two because Christ was human, he was divine. Yeah. But he was also light of the world. Yeah. And the light is given to cast out darkness. No matter how dark this room gets, if you light a candle, darkness dissipates. But as Christ is light of the world, he shares that with us. So all the believers, be light in the world. You're not the light of the world, but you're light in the world. If there's anything jacked up on your job, when you show up, it all changes. Amen. If there's anything jacked up when you speak up, things ought to change. Because you are light in the world. Amen. I hope I'm making sense. If we look at this candle, it's supposed to be giving away something called smoke. Because smoke symbolizes smoke symbolizes the presence of God or the Holy Spirit. So each time we come into service, even in funerals, we like this because we don't ever want it to be a day that the people fail to understand that Christ, even at a funeral, is still like the world. Things don't change God. God changed things. I hope I'm making sense. Here we have the cross, and in the Catholicism tradition, we will understand that Christ will be hanging there. His body will still be present on the cross. But in the Protestant world, we have the body of Christ absent to say to us that he is no longer hanging in dead, but he's absent from the cross. He died, but he's Alive. We don't look for him in the tomb 
because we know he's risen. And we don't look for him on the cross because we know his work on the cross, he said, is finished. So you ask, well, why do we have the symbol of the cross there? Because it's communicated to us that the cross vertical line is a representation of God reaching down his hand to humanity to say, even though you have fallen, I still will. I still will for us to be connected. God has never abandoned the desire for us to have fellowship with him and to walk alongside him every day. So we have this, this vertical reach, a vertical line that shows us that God, that communicates to us, the hand of God is extended to humanity. And one of the things I often get uh, teary-eyed about is that when I think about my past and where I came from, what I've been through, the things that sometimes I've got caught up in, and even now I get caught up in, that there is a loving God that sits high to have a desire to have a fellowship, a relationship with me. And I think about all of my brokenness and all of my, all, all of my carnality, and I think about all of those things, and yet you want to be involved with me? Mistake after mistake, promise after promise broken, you want to be involved with me? Hiccup after hiccup, you want to be involved with me? It's humbling to know that somebody like me, he loves so much that his hands are extended. Say, Gary, take. The horizontal line is still that line that represents his, his hand to us, but our hands to others. Do you remember how he hung? It was an invitation. Come unto me, all of you that labor in the heaven later, and I shall give you rest. It says for those of us who are without hope, come, because I am the hope of the world. He is a God that offers peace. Come, if you do not have it, it's open arms to say to the world, no matter how who you are, no matter where you're from, come. Thus is our reach to each other. So when you see this cross, it's an invitation as well as a confirmation. Mm -hmm. God in us, we're connected. Amen. God's reach to us in our reaching. Amen. He wouldn't do this work by himself. He wants us to share in the work. As we have been saying, our lives ought to be that of such that others would want to be saved. Hasten into the text as you read before us and we get to that part where he said that he took bread and he took bread. He took bread. He took bread and he blessed it. Yeah. And he gave thanks. <laughs> then he broke it. And after he broke it, he gave it. He took bread and he blessed it. And he gave thanks for it. Then he broke it. And then he gave it. That bread is symbolic of the body of Christ. His body. Am I introducing cannibalism? No. Cannibalism means eating flesh, human flesh. Because that was a contention, I think, over in Corinth. When he says that, except you eat my, in the New Testament, except you eat my, my flesh and drink of my blood, you shall have no part of this. And they say, wait a minute, what are you saying? We, we, no, 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 I'm not saying capitalism. What I'm saying is the symbolic meaning of when you take bread, that this bread is symbolic of me having given myself to you and allowing myself to be broken in this verse that you may be partakers of me. So when we take the element of bread, we're not eating bread. We're taking Jesus in. Yeah. Amen. You remember the, the, the argument in Corinth that people got there was trying to eat all they could because they thought they were at Lewis. And Paul admonished them, no, no, no. When we come together for the Lord's Supper, we do not come that we might eat. No, no, you can eat all you want to eat at home. But we come gathering for fellowship. And even those who have not, that they're able to partake of this Lord's Supper because they need to 
know that he came for them as well. So the thing that we need to know is this, I missed the point, is that when Jesus starts to text out at verse number 20, he says that when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve, and he begins to talk about betrayal. One of you will betray me. Pick this out. He picked out 12 folk. And then Jesus in 12, he picked one that would betray him. So what I need to understand that every one of us, Judas was his name, every one of us, no matter what we have gone wrong in our lives, we still have an invite to the table. No matter. I know you said you wouldn't do it no more. You can still come. To this table. I know there are some things that you are shy about, embarrassed about. Go ahead, son. It doesn't negate you from coming Amen. to the table. No, Judas proves to us that even with a heart of ill intent towards him, that he did not deny the opportunity yes. to come to have fellowship with him. Amen. And every sinner needs to know that no matter how jacked up I am, the opportunity for me to have fellowship at this table is still possible in a reality. I preached a long time ago about the people that sat around this table because Peter would deny him. John would doubt him. But Jesus still allowed them to come to the table because of the omniscientness of him, who he is in wisdom, to be able to have foresight before it happens and be able to experience the present moment. He was able to know that Peter would do what he would do, that John would do what he would do, and that Judas would do what he would do. But nonetheless, I invited them all to the table. So if we don't come to Christ, we have no one to blame except ourselves. Because this altar table is for every last one of us. Amen. So he said, this is my body, which is given for you. As often as you do it, take, eat and do it in remembrance. I need you to know something. That when you got saved, he simply took you and blessed you and gave thanks for you. The next part we don't want. But he wants to pray you so that he can disperse you to others. It's called your life assignment. Many of us don't want the assignment. Because we want to sing these beautiful songs and, 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 and I, I listen to myself sometimes. I don't want no storm. I don't want no rain. I don't want to know any pain. But to be broken sometimes is pain. And not broken because I'm bad, but broken because he has purpose for me. Every purpose is not a pleasure purpose. Sometimes you're going to have to go through stuff for the sake of being an aid for somebody else. Uh, sometimes you're going to go through stuff just to be a pioneer for somebody else. Uh, you ask him, why must I have all of this pain? Because it's somebody lost in the valley trying to get As ridiculous as it seems, because we live in a society where people are super lazy, <laughs> They would rather look at anybody that go to church and say, that's the script I'm going to read. Rather than open the scripture for themselves. Amen. You're saying that's not fair, is it not? Amen. Is it not? Is it not? Most people will be drawn to Christ because of your life in them. Your tenacity. Your faith, your fortitude, your long suffering, your endurance, your patience, your gentleness, your humility, they will be drawn to Christ because of your life. Example. Hastening towards the other point, we understand that the table is for everybody. That's the first point you should get. And even in betrayal. And all of us are guilty of betraying you. Amen. If you haven't done it, you're probably on the road. Uh, and betrayal is, is not simply that, that you sold him for silver. 
Betrayal is that you put you in front of him. Amen. Why, 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 why does he say, this is my body? Because most of us, that's where our struggle is. In our body. In our body. We either like it, dislike it, want to improve it, want to change it. Why do you think plastic surgery is so popular? Because people see something they want to change. Why do you think people hit the gym? Because they want to change Why do people have low self-esteem? Because something about them they can't accept about them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we'll focus more on the exterior than the interior. I, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how much you shave this and sculpt it. At the end of the day, you will always find something that you don't like. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, your outside ought to bother you less. If you can't hear yourself and that don't bother you, if you can't see yourself and that don't bother you, if you can't hear your thoughts and that don't bother you, I don't care how you fix the outside, the inside will still be good. Yeah. I'm going to speak from a male perspective, and this is really vain and shallow. I have seen some beautiful women in my lifetime. I'm talking about when I was 16, 17, 18. Yeah, yeah. And to see them, you can say, ooh. And to hear them, you say, whoa. Wow. I mean, she is everything that you might want. And she opens her mouth. Yes, sir. Or she begins to display her behavior. You can say, I can do without that. <laughs> leave him alone, leave him alone, leave him alone. Don't ask me that me. I know you sit beside somebody and say, honey, is that me? The answer is, he's going to tell you my answer. I love you the way you are. That's the right answer. <laughs> Hey, don't, don't you answer it. Let me give you your answer. If it comes up, do you have a problem with me? Your answer is no. Not right now. So now he moves on to say, this is my body. Then he introduces something else and said, this he takes, take the cup. Notice what he does. He blesses it. He gives thanks. He gives it to them to say, drink it. Now, here's the thing that, that caught me. Is that he says, here's my body. My body has to die. Y'all ain't never heard that before? Amen. That, that you got to lay down your life. Amen. You have to bring your body into subjection. Yes. If you don't, it will miss you. Yeah. It'll miss you. Yeah. Yep. Here's the last thing because I got a cup. The last thing is he offers a cup. He tells them, drink it. It is the blood. The cup is a symbol of blood. Watch this. What can wash away my sins? Most of us are not, we're not as messed up on the outside as we are on the inside. Yes, sir. So why, why the blood? Because Jesus understands that if you get this in your system, <laughs> you, you know, when you take your antibiotics, they tell you, this needs to get in your, in your system. If it's going to help you, you've got to take it long enough for it to get in your, your system. What Jesus does by the drinking of by saying, drink the blood, take this cup, what he's really saying to us is that, that purge and take place on the end. Yeah. Amen. Our sin issues are from the. Your problem ain't your eyes. Your problem is your heart. Amen. Amen. Most, most of them. Ooh, Lord. If, 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 my hand. It ain't your hand. 
You, you just got to get the atoning, redemptive blood in your system. Eleven, eight o'clock didn't get this, but you're going to get it. So when we remove this veil, it's only after removal of this veil that we discover that there are elements here. There is no body. But the body, the elements are symbolic of Christ's body and blood. And I expressed it sometimes that he withheld nothing. Yes. He gave himself in total, in totality for our redemption. Now here's the last thing. You see this Bible here? It rests on this table. Shut that down on. It rests on this table because it communicates to us that the word of God is always open and available to us. The Bible should never be closed. And it should always, when these elements are not here, should always rest on this table to let people know that the Word of God is free and is open to the public. And for whoever desires to look into His Word, they're able to look into His Word and find it. Now, these little things that we have on the Bible here, uh, this, this is not decoration. These are called, these are our page holders. Because whatever I preached last week, is where this Bible is supposed to be this week until we finish this week. Amen. And it'll move from that to this. So that if you come in as a reader through the week and want to engage in the Word of God and say, what did Pastor preach about? What was the message about? What was the content of it? You might not know exactly, but if you read from left to right, you've got the meat Amen. of the message. Amen. Amen. These colors represent seasons, and they represent things. White is a symbol of? Red is a symbol of? The blood. Green is a symbol of? Purple is a symbol of? Royalty. Thank you. You know this. <laughs> you all get an A minus. All right? Here is what I need you to know as you walk away today. I need you to know, when you come in on Sunday morning, even if this is not here, in this, the purpose of it being centered on this table is that no matter where we are, we're all looking at the same thing. Amen. It's the center of our lives. Yes. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. It is the center. It is to recall us from all distractions. Is remind us that he is the light of the world. Amen. We are not stars. He is. Amen. Amen. We are just agents. Of Amen. Thank you, Lord. I do pray when you look at this table from now on, you're able to see the redemptive story. That he came as a perfect sacrifice for me. He laid down his life. Nobody took it from him, but he laid down his life that I might live abundantly. Glory, crosses, God is reaching down to us. And as I connect with God, my response to connecting with God is to reach out to humanity. Amen. Your life ought to be making a difference somewhere. Amen. On your job, your life ought to be making Amen. a difference. In your home, your life Amen. ought to be making a difference. In your community, your life ought to be making a difference. And you ought to be open to inviting people in. I'm going to tell you, if some people going to come your way that's not going to smell like you. There's some people come to you that's going to have a different dialect. But what is your response? Invite them. Invite them. Because I need you to know right now, when I came to Jesus, I wasn't where I am. And God knows I was messed up. But he took me as I was. Amen. But as my response to him, every day somebody say, with Jesus, get sweeter and sweeter. I will tell you this much. Going along with Jesus, your life is better and better. Amen. Amen. This table is a reminder that he laid it all down for us. Yes, Lord. That there's no more need for a dove or a ram or a bullock or a goat. No. Because some people might not be able to afford it. He's paid it all. Yes. Jesus paid it. He paid it all. Here's the Bible, my eyes are closed. Amen. If you 
here today and you came in and you did not have Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life.